Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey folks, it's Shay here, and thanks for listening to another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are new to the podcast, welcome to the show. Today, we are visiting with Dr. Jeff Sarche, and we are going to be talking about reproductive vaccine protocols. Thank you, Zoetis, for helping make this episode possible. And before we dive in, I do want to remind you that if you are looking for a speaker for your next event, I would be happy to be a part of your event and add value to what you're already creating by being either a keynote speaker, panel speaker, or leading a workshop. For more information, head to my website, casualcattleconversations.com, and hit the contact me form or contact us form, and uh, you can connect with me there. With that, let's get on with the episode. Well, I am here with Dr. Jeff Sarche today, and we are going to be talking about pre-breeding vaccines for the cow herd and developing heifers. And I'm excited to bring this conversation and topic to the show. It's a new one for the show and definitely an important one. So before we dive into the topic, Jeff, would you please give your, give a brief introduction to the listeners about your role in the beef industry today and your background in the veterinarian space. Sure. Currently I'm a beef technical service veterinarian with Zoetis. I support sales in Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas. Um, I do mainly stalker backgrounder with cow calf and a little bit of a uh, feedlot. Before I've worked for Zoetis for 10 years now, but prior to that, I was a mixed animal practitioner. I grew up in the Oklahoma Panhandle, uh, went to veterinary school with the goal in mind to be a feed yard consultant. Um, I've done that quite a bit of that through my career too, but, uh, after going to veterinary school, I wanted to do more practice too. I had a mixed animal practice in Hugot in Kansas for 25 years. I uh, did all kinds of, uh, cow calf stalker background work and feed yard work as well as other mixed animal practice. Well, great. I appreciate you being on the show today. So before we dive into a few other questions, I really want to talk about the economic impact of implementing or maybe not implementing these reproductive vaccines in people's herd health programs. So what is the impact of not having reproductive vaccines in your herd health program as a cattle producer? Yeah, Shay, I, I look at it from a risk standpoint. So if you look at the numbers, one of the, probably the best number that I can give you is a, an estimate by USDA on a survey they did in 2007 on reproductive losses. So that would include open cows, abortions, and uh, newborn calf mortality. And their estimate in 2007 was that's about $500 million. Um, so if you divide that by whatever the cow herd is, which fluctuates anywhere from 28 million to 32, 33 million, but that's around 15, $16 per cow. So that's what your risk is on an average every year per cow. Now, some, not everybody will lose $15 per cow. Some, some herds may not lose much less than that. And some will lose a lot more than that because these problems tend to, um, some of them are more uh, prevalent and consistent, but like abortion storms and stuff are usually, uh, more random and they occur when whenever exposure occurs. So if that happens, I had one client that ended up with a 43% calving crop. So to them, the economic impact 
was way more severe than $16 a head. But I had other clients that, you know, probably lost three or $4 a head. So it's a risk that's out there. And I think we need to do what we can to manage that risk. Well, when we look at expenses as cow-calf producers, open cows are a big expense. I mean, yeah. sometimes we think about inputs, but that open cow, if she doesn't have a calf, that's a big expense. It is. So when we're talking about reproductive vaccines, what diseases are we trying to pre prevent? On the reproductive side, uh, there's really, on the viruses, there's two big ones, BVD virus and IBR virus. Uh, they're both clinically pretty different. Well, IBR, which is a herpes virus, um, that causes the abortion storms, like what I mentioned earlier. If you get um, an exposure, especially in an unvaccinated or poorly vaccinated herd, uh, you can get what we call abortion storms. So you can have anywhere from 25 to 50 or even greater percent of the cows abort uh, because they get infected. They, the virus kills the fetus within even quicker than 24 hours. Um, the fetus a lot of times doesn't abort until two or three, four days after that. So sometimes it's difficult to diagnose that because the fetus has been dead for several days before it's aborted. And so it's hard to uh, find the virus. It's a little bit easier now with PCR test technology because it's a lot more sensitive. But uh, with IBR, that's usually what you'll, the risk you have. With BVD, it's a lot more complicated. Really depends on when the cow gets infected during her pregnancy. So if it's very early, the virus is going to kill the embryo and you may just see a, a late breeder or an open cow. If it's between, if the infection occurs between 45 and 120 or 140 days, that's when the fetus is developing its immune system and actually programming the immune to what is itself and what is foreign. So if that virus shows up at that time, it programs the virus as part of itself. And it creates what we call a persistent infection, or that calf is permanently infected with BVD virus and will shed BVD virus every day as long as it's alive. Um, if the infection happens later on, like mid or mid gestation, you can it can result in birth defects, uh, such as kind of a domed head, like a chihuahua shaped head, um, some eye problems, some uh, feet and leg abnormalities. They're all birth defects. Um, or it can result in an abortion. If the infection happens very late in the gestation or the pregnancy, that calf can just be born with a, in, what we call a congenital infection, or it was born with a BVD infection. Now, this is not going to be persistent. It may kill the calf or they may get over it, but it's born with an infection. And those calves, a lot of times, are weak or may even be stillborn. So there are a lot of different clinical symptoms that you may see with the BVD virus. Um, so anywhere from open cows to abortions to birth defects, the really critical one and the one that we concentrate on a lot is the persistent infected one because that calf can appear completely normal, but that's a calf that's going to be a source of infection uh, for your herd. And you really need to identify that and get it out of the herd. So what about like leptospirosis or fibrosis? Because those okay. are some common ones that I hear right. as well. Right. So now we're 
more into the bacteria. Lepto is a bacterial disease that's um, most of the lepto. There's a lot of different strains of lepto. There's you may hear of a five way lepto vaccine. That's those are the most common the five most common strains that we usually see. So those are the ones we put in the vaccine. Those strains are not a normal infection in cattle. So cattle is usually what we call an incidental host. The, the typical host depends on the strain. It may be rodents, it may be pigs, it may be dogs, um, but then cattle get exposed kind of accidentally and uh, it causes pretty severe disease in them. Usually uh, it can cause kidney disease severe enough to kill the cow or, a, you know, a, a younger calf, um, or it can kill the fetus and result in an abortion. And it really, that risk can incur pretty much any time during the gestation. Um, and even open cows are at risk of getting lepto. Now the fetus is not at risk because they're open, but the cow can still get lepto and become sick. So the, the risk from lepto is really pretty much year round. Um, and then you have vibriosis, which is a different bacteria, Campylobacter fetus. Uh, it is a venereal disease that's spread through breeding. Uh, so if a bull breeds an infected cow, he's going to then infect the next several cows that he breeds. Um, typically, that causes early embryonic death. So the clinical signs uh, you would see would be either a repeat breeder, either your calving distribution is really shifted to later calving cows, or if you remove the bull in, say, 60 days or whatever, you'll have a bunch of open cows because they don't, they will rebreed after they've aborted or that embryo is, has died. But it'll usually take them um, 45 to 60 days to rebreed. So they're going to be two to three months later bred than what you would expect. Um, that's kind of a tip off that it may be. Uh, vibriosis. However, there's another disease called trichomonas that uh, is a protozoal disease that again is uh, transmitted sexually. However, the, the reservoir is usually the bull. Once the bull gets infected, uh, that organism lives in the sheath and pretty much is there, once they get infected, they, they can't clear it and there's no treatment for it. Um, however, you can also have some cows that will be chronically infected. So for trick, trick the key is to, you've got to test your bulls before you turn them in with the cows and make sure they're clean. But it's also important to preg check your cows and to get rid of any open cows because the open cows are more likely to be carrying either Vibrio or Trick or possibly even um, those two that are venereal diseases are the most important. Uh, and if you leave her in that the herd and breed her again next year, now there's a source to reinfect your bulls and you start over with the same problem. Uh, or if you, some people will move an open cow from a fall herd to a spring herd or vice versa, you run the same risk there of reinfecting or infecting a, a negative bull that breeds that cow. So it's really best to get rid of open cows. Um, they've proven that reproductively, they're not as good as their herd mates. And they are a bigger risk from a health standpoint standpoint also. So I talked about the five-way leptos. That there's another lepto that is a natural disease of cattle, and that's leptoharjo bovis. Um, it's actually the species is Borg petersenii. Um, it doesn't 
make the cow really sick because it's been in a natural infection of cows for eons. Uh, the clinical symptom that you'll see is, is a conception issue or your preg check will rate will be a little bit lower. Uh, it is somewhat difficult to diagnose. It's pretty common in a lot of herds. Uh, most people, one of the best ways you can tell whether it's a problem or not is you start using the vaccine and your conception rate goes up usually two to 5%. So if that is uh, a different lepto, because on the vaccine side, I talked about how the five-way leptos will only last for about five or six months. Uh, there are some hardra bovis vaccines that will last for a year. So if you have that, um, that's one that it doesn't matter when you give it. Uh, if you know that the the duration of immunity will last for a year it's not it does add some expense to your to your vaccine protocol and uh, most of the producers that are using it are the really highly efficient progressive producers that are you know probably in the 95 percent conception rate and they're wanting to get it even higher well, thank you for walking through those different diseases that we as cattle producers need to be aware of. Before we kind of dive into what producers need to look for in vaccines, what are some instances where these, like how are these diseases being introduced to different herd or being introduced to herds? Okay. Uh, well, for like lepto, like I said, that is from usually um, an outside host. So it is, lepto grows in, in um, standing water. So they pick it up through the water source usually, but that water source a lot of times gets contaminated by the, the host species, which may be, you know, carnival, maybe dogs, coyotes, depends on the species, maybe wild hogs, maybe uh, rodents and things like that. So they they get infected that way. Um, most of the others, most of the viruses, it's a direct contact. BVD or IBR is going to be uh, aerosol transmission. So that can be an addition to the herd or that could be something that was transmitted even across a fence line. So if there are stalker cattle, both of those viruses are part of the bovine respiratory disease. So they're very common in younger cattle too. So if you have stalker cattle or um, a background or something like that, it shares a fence line your herd is at risk of getting exposed that way. Uh, with trick, uh, trick and vibrio, they're both sexually transmitted, so it's important to test, test all your bulls and know that they're negative before you ever put them in with the herd every single time. So that means if you have a spring and a fall herd, you need to test the bulls twice a year, not just once a year because they may have picked something up with the spring herd and now you put them in with your fall herd and you, you cause an infection in your fall herd. So every time before you put them in, you need to test the bulls. And then, like I said, test, test the cows that are, or get rid of the cows that are open. I guess this is really valuable one. You could do testing to make sure she's not uh, infected or something. Another, you know, with both of those diseases, since they are spread um, sexually, if you're doing AI, you you eliminate that risk because it's not spread through the semen. It's it's usually spread from the bull. Um, those are the main things. The, the biggest thing is that to talk with your veterinarian and set up a biosecurity plan on what diseases do you need are, are the biggest risk 
are, are the most likely that you'll run into. Uh, and what can you do to to minimize the you know the likelihood that you'll introduce that into your herd? Well, thank you for walking through that. Okay, so now that we've talked about what different diseases we can be susceptible to and where they come from or how cow herds can be exposed, let's talk about that risk management side, the vaccine side. So what do cattlemen and women need to be looking for when they're looking at which vaccines to use in their herd? Yeah, it, you need to be aware of some of these diseases are more uh, geographical, have geography will play a little bit of a role in it. Um, depends on if you're, the, the biggest ex example of that would be red water disease on the clostridial size. And that is, is a certain uh, clostridium that you see in uh, cattle that have flukes. So the flukes cause damage in the liver and then the clostridium grows in the damaged liver and they die. Um, so that doesn't happen in areas that you don't have flukes. So that's a difference. That is the, the clostridium, that's the extra eight. So if you're talking about an eight way versus a seven way black leg, that is the disease we're talking about. That's usually you need the eight way when you're in a fluke uh, area or area with flukes. Um, when I graduated 30 years ago, trick was a geographical ge a disease that mattered about geography and is more in the Western states. But I think because the um, movement of cattle, it has pretty much become ubiquitous all over the United States. Um, so you need to talk or talk to somebody and understand what what diseases are are your big, biggest risk, um, and then look at what vaccines provide protection from those. The best way to do that is to read the label. It will have the indication of what they're what they're uh, labeled to protect from. Now with the viruses, there's a difference between because IBR, I mentioned IBR and BVD both cause reproductive issues. They also both cause respiratory issues. So uh, just because a vaccine has IBR in it does not mean that it necessarily is indicated to prevent IBR abortions. So that needs to be on the label, you know, that prevents IBR abortions. And the same thing with BVD. If that's what we call fetal protection, because it's much harder to protect the fetus inside the dam, or we have to have a much higher level of protection to protect the fetus, because it becomes infected much easier than the cow does because the fetus doesn't have it. It's pretty much relying on the cow for to protect it until even late in pregnancy. It has an immune system then, but it's not very strong. So it can get infected much easier than the cow can. So a vaccine has to be much stronger to provide fetal protection than it does to provide respiratory infection. So for example, for a respiratory disease, it would take about a million BVD particles to infect the fetus and cause a fetal infection. It only takes 11 or a, a thousand BVD virus particles. So number one, does a vaccine provide fetal protection? Number two, what diseases uh, does the vaccine protect against? And number three, how long can we expect that uh, protection to last? Uh, for example, the five-way leptos that I talked about, 
we know that all of the five-way leptoses on the market, the duration of immunity that you can get from one shot is only about five to six months. So if that risk is there for nine to 12 months a year, ideally we need to give the five-way vaccine, lepto vaccines two times a year to cover our risk. Those are the things you need to, to know. And it's, it's really a good idea to talk with your veterinarian to, uh, because they're, they're a little more educated on what the diseases are and how long the vaccines last and things like that. And they can help you develop a vaccine protocol that, that should meet your goals. So you brought up timing a little bit for when to give those vaccines. Can you touch a little bit more on that for when cattle producers need to be timing these vaccines for heifers and cows? Right. So overall, if our goal on the reproductive side, our number one goal is to protect the fetus. So it kind of makes sense giving those vaccines before pre-breeding makes makes the most sense. Uh, however, there are some vaccines that have a 12-month duration of immunity. And when I say that, it means that they've gone through challenge studies where they challenged the animals 12 months later and they were still protected. So we know they last at least 12 months so if I have a vaccine that has a 12 month duration of immunity, timing really doesn't matter because they're protected all year around. So now I can give that whenever I want to. However, if I don't have 12 months of duration, now timing becomes pretty important. And the, the one example that I think is illustrates that the best is Vibrio. So Vibrio is most of the issues are first trimester because it's early embryonic death. So that's when my risk is, is in the first trimester. But it is Vibrio vaccines are, are like lepto vaccines and most of them that are in the VL5 combinations, that duration is only five to six months. So if we give a VL5 combination at preg check, it's gonna run out about the time we're gonna turn the bulls out. And so it's really not doing us any good at all. If we give it pre-breeding and it run out, runs out five months later, we covered the first five months, which is when our risk is. So that's the ideal time to give a Vibrio is pre-breeding. Now there are a few Vibrio vaccines on the market with longer duration. And so if if it's you know really impossible to do pre-breeding, you know, you can can uh, talk to your veterinarian and you find a Vibrio that that does have you know a seven, eight, nine month duration, and you might be able to get away with giving it a, a preg check. But those are the things we don't want to be just, you know, giving these vaccines to make ourselves feel better. We really want to give them so that they work and protect the cattle. Well, if if we're not giving them, if well, first of all, we're going to talk about some vaccine efficacy stuff at the end here. But if we're not giving vaccines in a timely manner so that they work, it's not really risk protection or worth our money. So we want to make sure that we're on the right track with that. Now you mentioned giving some vaccines pre-breeding. Do producers also need to be considering if those vaccines need to be given 30 or 45 days beforehand, or can they be given when the bulls turned out? What does, what considerations need to be going there? So we might, we might first talk about killed vaccines and modified live vaccines, because that's where um, it matters. Uh, a killed vaccine, the advantage is that that virus or bacteria or whatever is inactivated. It's It cannot replicate. And so that's a big 
advantage from a safety standpoint because I can give that whenever I want to. I'm not going to cause a problem. Some of the modified live viruses, are they do replicate. And especially uh, IBR virus, it it's not going to make the animal, the cow or the calf sick, but it can infect the fetus and kill the fetus if that cow has never seen it before. So if you give it to a, a cow that's never been vaccinated or exposed to IBR, it can actually kill the fetus and abort it. And so we don't want to do that. Um, and there's also some evidence that because that is a, a live virus, it can also um, infect the, the uh, ovary and cause some inflammation on the ovary and maybe cause a lower conception rate if we give it too close to breeding. So that's only on naive cattle. So once they've been vaccinated, they have antibodies to that. And so now we can give them that to a pregnant animal or to an animal pre-breeding and we don't see them the same, same things. So number one, it's you've got to know what the status of the cow is. And number two, you have to know whether you're giving a modified live or a killed vaccine. Now, there is one vaccine that Zoetis has that kind of fits in between the two. It is a modified live vaccine that you mix together, but the IBR is temperature sensitive. So it cannot get to the fetus and kill it because the body temperature stops that from rep replicating. So it is just as safe as giving a killed vaccine, but the benefit it, with the modified live vaccines is they replicate and uh, simulate a natural infection much closer to the real virus, and they stimulate other parts of the immune response that a killed vaccine just can't do because when when the immune system doesn't see that organism replicating, it doesn't say, cause the same response as, as it does when it sees an organism, a vaccine that, that is replicating. So bottom line, we get better protection generally from a modified live, but we have more safety with the kill. The Cattle Master product is kind of unique because you get kind of the best of both worlds. You can give it to an unvaccinated cow, it will not cause an abortion, but we have studies that show you can get um, similar protection to a modified live vaccine. So pre-breeding, if we're giving a modified live vaccine to a cow that's never been vaccinated, we can cause some inflammation on the ovary there and hurt our conception rate. Most of the vaccines are labeled to not give them 30 days prior to bull turnout or breeding. Um, I tend to push that back a little bit to 45 days uh, for a couple reasons. One, my experience, uh, I had didn't really feel like I saw any problems at all when we moved it back 45 days. And if you look at the development of the egg in the ovary, that whole process from start to finish is 39 days. So if I gave that vaccine 45 days before breeding, I'm pretty confident that I, I shouldn't have had any effect on, on the developing egg. Uh, and so it should be safer doing that. Uh, now, if you're given a killed vaccine, uh, shouldn't have an, an issue with causing uh, inflammation on the ovaries, but we also have to think about cattle because they are prey animals, and when we're handling them and we put them through stress, uh, that can affect their conception too. So I, I don't like handling them. Uh, I prefer to handle them 
you know, 45 or 60 days prior to breeding, if, if that's possible. So you've touched on a few different aspects of protocols, but I want to talk about it a little bit more. What are a few examples of reproductive vaccine protocols that you see being effective? Well, Shay, let's, I like to start with the replacement heifers because to me, that's kind of the beginning of her reproductive life. And before that, you know, when I'm setting up protocols, I'll usually start with the calf and, you know, from birth until post weaning, we're a lot more worried about scours and respiratory. So, you know, those vac- the protocols will be aimed at those diseases. Post-breeding, when we get into a reprodu- you know, a replacement heifer, now I'm worried about, more worried about reproductive diseases. So now the lepto and vibrio need to be incorporated, uh, you know, brucellosis. Um, and then the the vaccines that have fetal protection that, you know, I've talked different about, you know, does the vaccine protect about IBR abortion? So does it actually protect the fetus? Um, so uh, on a replacement heifer, we talked about modified live or, or killed vaccines. And on a replacement heifer, it really shouldn't matter because we expect them to be open uh, we want them to be open when we start this, and if they happen to be bred, and we, I always recommend a modified live fetal protection vaccine for, for heifers. Uh, if she happens to be bred, I probably don't want that breeding because she's probably bred to her brother or a neighbor's bull or some kind of bull that I have no idea what it is and may have, you know, Number one, I probably don't want those genetics. And number two, you're probably going to have calving problems. So it's probably a plus if I cause an abortion by vaccinating her with the modified live vaccine in that situation. I'm also getting a, I'm priming her immune system with with the best vaccine I can when I'm giving the modified live vaccine. Uh, so Wattis actually did a study where we did that, where we gave two doses of Bovashield to the replacement heifers, and then we compared whether we gave the cows a cattle master or a Bovashield. Now, cattle master's the killed vaccine, Bovashield's a modified live, and we actually found that we didn't see any difference as far as efficacy. But with the cattle master, you have... So if you start with the Bovishield as a heifer, two doses. Now at prick check, I can give her cattle master or leave her on Bovishield. And the reason I might want to go to cattle master is especially in herds where I'm adding cattle all the time and I may get some cattle in there that have not had the modified live previously. So now if they did get cattle master, they're not going to abort. So there's a little as- aspect of safety there. Uh, so once, once you get into the cow herd, it's more of a preference of whether you're, you know, more safety, lean more toward the safety, do no harm, or whether I want to get the maximum efficacy and go with a modified live. But on the replacement heifer, in my opinion, she always go with the modified live because the studies prove that you get much better protection uh, starting with that. Now you need to do that. They need to get two doses of that, but you also have a lot of flexibility. I said post weaning. So some people will count actually the dose they got at weaning uh, as their first vaccine. And that's okay, but it's not ideal because that was probably a respiratory vaccine and not a reproductive vaccine, probably didn't have the lepto and vibrio in it. And they need to get two doses, probably more important than to get two doses of the lepto vibrio than it is that they get two doses of the virus. Uh, So anywhere 
you know, I usually say about 60 days after weaning, once you know you're past any respiratory issues, uh, give them their first dose then. Now you can give them the second dose anytime you want to from that point up until about 45, 60 days before breeding. So there's, you know, an eight, nine month period there that, you know, they just need to get two doses in them and you have some flexibility. Now that heifer is set up, I can give a modified live when she's pregnant and it's no problem, or I can switch back to a kill by cattle master and, and give it at. So those are the protocols. I think, you know, I don't really, I mean, those are the protocols that probably fit more a uh, broad, you know, producer. If you start with the the Bova Shield and the, the replacement heifers, and then go to whichever one you want after a cow. Um, but I think it's critical that you use the modified live in in the replacement. All right. Well, thank you for walking through and explaining that. Absolutely. So. As we think about, you know, you brought up that handling standpoint, and I know as cattle producers, we can sometimes feel stretched on time and it's hard to find good labor or good help. So every time we run cattle through that chute, it, it feels like it's more time taken away from other things. What, how can producers shift their mindset about this or what do they need to be thinking or realizing if including reproductive vaccines or any other part of their herd health protocol adds another time through the shoot of working cattle. Yeah, I, I talk about this quite a bit. And um, one of the ways, I mean, the, I kind of, I'm pretty analytical. And when I look at, okay, I evaluate, say, one vaccine versus another, or warmer, or antibiotic, whatever, any product, really, there's I used to say four categories or four things that I would look at. One would be efficacy. Are there differences in efficacy? I talked a little bit about that on a modified live versus a killed. Um, are there differences in safety? Again, we have differences between modified and killed, but you also have differences in between products in, in those categories, Nick. So efficacy, safety, Cost is usually a consideration uh, and convenience. And I don't know why, but it seems to me that as a cattle industry, we tend to put cost and convenience first and foremost. And uh, personally, if we're vaccinating these cattle for their protection, uh, our convenience should probably be the last consideration is, <laughs> you know, you can maybe argue it's not convenient for them to go through the shoot either, but, uh, I think we really need to really think about, you know, how much convenience should play in our decisions. The fifth thing that I've added really since COVID is availability. And we've seen that even in the vaccines, a lot of the vaccines our company had to issue a couple of years ago, uh, some other companies are having to where you flat just can't get the vaccine you want to use. So now you have to go find a different one that maybe you've never used before. And um, so if you have a product that you know you can get and it's reliable, that's, that's worth quite a bit. Um, but on the, you know, the cost side of it, we talked about your risk is $16, it was $16 in 2007. Today, it's at least double that, if not triple that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, your your costs are of your vaccines or your whole herd health programs should be, you know, probably less than $15 pretty easily per cow. So, a dollar or two difference, you know, especially when we're talking 
$1,800, calves, that's not very meaningful today. Other times when we're talking about $600 calves, then it's a little more important to, to pay attention to your costs. However, your, your input costs from your vaccines and dewormers and stuff like that is usually about seven per, five to 7% of your total input costs. So you could completely eliminate that and it's not gonna make a huge difference in your bottom line as far as saving money. But it could make a huge difference in your bottom line if you had an abortion storm and, you know, taking some of those out could, you know, because it's not a zero sum game, it's a biological system we're putting it into. And so I take my IBR vaccine out or switch to a, from a modified life to a killed and I have an abortion storm uh, that can be very, very costly. And uh, I'm kicking myself for trying to save those dollars. <laughs> right. So, you know, you've brought up multiple times, consult with your local veterinarian. And mm -hmm. with that, what information do we as cattle producers need to be sharing with our veterinarian to make sure that we have the most effective herd health protocol? Because they're not with us every day. Right. A couple things. Number one, you know, kind of let them know what your goal is. Uh, you know, are you, a, if they're not familiar with you, are you a seed stock producer? Or are you just a commercial cow calf or is this just a hobby herd? Um, you know, what, what are you trying to do? Uh, number two, what are your priorities? Uh, because if your number one priority is cost and convenience and you're not going to budge from that, then I don't, you know, as a veterinarian, I don't need to spend a lot of time talking to you about, you know, vaccine comparison trials and things like that, because you just want the cheapest, easiest thing you can give versus I have other people that say, doc, I just want the very best thing. You know, really the animal's health is number one and maybe they're an attorney and this is a hobby and, cost is really off the table. So those are two totally different, you know, I would make two totally di different protocols for those two individuals based on what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, so it's important that they understand that because sometimes, and I caught myself doing it as a veterinarian, you try to spend your customers or your clients money for them and sometimes your, your priorities are not the same as theirs. And they're like, oh, I would have easily paid the extra money for some, you know, an additional vaccine that cost maybe double. And, you know, they ended up having a problem with, say, leptohargeo bovis. And where other people say, uh, that's going to double my vaccine costs. I, you know, I'll take the risk, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and spend less on my vaccine. So it's, it's nice to know from the client, you know, I mean, you don't want to give them your checkbook, but, but, but to let them know, you know, what your priorities are. Okay. So before we dive into vaccine efficacy, I do want to point out that we've talked a lot about prevention because prevention is key, but what if there's someone out there listening today who maybe thinks, you know, maybe they had a lot of open cows when PG rolled around, or they might think there might be something running through their herd. How do they get tested or find out what to do next? Yeah, that's, uh, again, probably seek some professional help through a veterinarian. Uh, there are a few clues that can give you some, um, like I mentioned when I was talking about BVD, uh, you may have open cows, but some of the things I would ask was, do you have, have you had cows with, or calves with birth defects? And they will say, like, well, yeah, you know, I had one or two. Uh, so I have birth defects. 
and then I may say, okay, let's let's test your calves for BVDPI. So if you have persistent infection, you know, calves with BVD persi persistent infection, uh, now you have kind of a whole gamut. Probably your problem is BVD. Although typically it kind of starts also with with what what was their original herd health program? Where if they're not vaccinating for anything, I would guess they have more than one problem because these diseases don't run by themselves. And you know, you could have IBR and BVD both in a, in a herd, or you could have lepto and BVD in a herd. So um, the other thing about abortion open cows is one thing it it's difficult to really diagnose for sure what caused that um and abortions can be difficult too because number one a lot of times you don't find the fetus you don't even know they were aborted until they don't calve and they come up open um, but even if you do find the fetus uh, even the lab uh may only come up with a cause for the abortion uh, about a third of the time. Uh, because for what I said, the fetus has been dead, the, the virus dies before we get it to the to the lab. Or uh, we you know we didn't have the right tissues. So I would suggest if you're if you're dealing with an abortion problem, uh, collect everything that you can. The, feed, the placenta is a really good tissue. A lot of times we can find the infections in the placenta when we cannot find them in the fetus and vice versa. So collect the placenta, collect the fetus, and really the best is to send the whole thing to the lab as soon as you can uh, and collect as many as you can. One of the things with Zoetis that I'm pretty proud as a company because we stand behind our vaccines. And if you have an issue like that, uh, let us know and we will actually help pay for the diagnostics to help, help figure out what the problem is. Um, but it's pretty rewarding when you can figure it out, but don't expect just because you have some tissues and send them to the lab that you're going to get a, an answer because especially with abortions, a lot of times we come up that and we don't know, or we may have some indication that it kind of looks like lepto, but we're not positive. Um, and then you, you have to, to kind of go from there. Well, thank you for walking through that. So my final question before we wrap up today is what are some general vaccine efficacy tips and handling instructions that we all need to be reminded of? Probably the best advice I can give anybody is to get in the habit of reading the label and not just the label on the box, but get the package insert and read the whole thing, uh, especially under indications so the indications is what that vaccine or antibiotic or whatever has been proven to be effective against. That's where I was talking about it. Maybe an IBR vaccine, um, but if it doesn't mention preventing IBR abortion, it's not a, it's not going to protect the fetus. Um, read the label. Read the indications. Read the safety. It also has a section under there under handling and storage. Most of the vaccines do need to be refrigerated. Uh, it is not good to uh, let them get warm, but it's not good to freeze them either, uh, especially any vaccine that has a bacterial component because the bacteria, some of the bacteria contain uh, toxin in the cell wall. And when you freeze it, you rupture that cell wall and release that toxin. And now it makes the vaccine, uh, you know, had adverse reactions. So read the labels as far as storage, how to give it, 
Some vaccines are labeled for intramuscular or subcutaneous. Some of them are only labeled for intramuscular. Some of them are only labeled for sub-Q. You know, BQA recommends that we give everything sub-Q, but that not if it's only labeled for IM. If it's labeled IM, you need to give it IM. Also look at the dose. Uh, is it two cc's per dose or is it five? Um, and understand, because if you're given two and you should be given five, that vaccine is not going to be effective. Um, also, on your vaccine handling, like I said, uh, make sure you're buying it where you know it's been refrigerated and handled right and keep it you know, in your refrigerator and check your refrigerator and make sure that the temperatures are okay. What we tend to do is everybody has a refrigerator in the shop or the working area or whatever that came out of the kitchen that, um, you know, if somebody didn't like or wasn't working right or something, but and it may not be working right out in the in the barn either. And we're putting a lot of dollars of vaccine in there and it may not be keeping it at the right temperature. The temperature should be between uh, about 40 and degrees and 35 to 45 degrees is ideal. Uh, and you need to check that because a lot of times you can get 20 degrees difference inside one refrigerator because it's not working right. The other thing is uh, syringes and needles. Um, use the correct size needle. And, you know, for a sub-Q injection, I don't like using anything over like three quarters of an inch. Um, for an IM injection, you need to be using an inch and a half. Uh, so a lot of people use a one inch to do both, and it's really not very good for either one. Um, so use a new sterile needle. Depends on if you're not in an anaplas endemic region, you know, you probably need to change that every 15 to 20 head. If you are in an anaplas endemic area, you need to change the needles on every head because you can actually transmit anaplasmosis just with the needle from one, one animal to the next. Uh, syringes, ideally um, the you know disposable syringes are the easiest to make sure that uh, you're, you're, you have a sterile clean syringe, but if you're using an automatic like a rude pistol grip syringe or a draw off syringe, what I recommend is that you label those for each vaccine so that you're never mixing vaccines in, in a syringe because the killed vaccines have chemicals in them that will actually inactivate a modified live vaccine. And so we don't want to cross contaminate them. Uh, and the product that's in the bottle should be fairly sterile as far as contaminations. So typically I recommend that you just rinse the syringe with some sterile water to get rid of any vaccine residue but don't take them apart and try to clean them because we usually contaminate them more with our hands when we're putting them back together than we clean them. Uh, so rinse them with sterile water, wash the outside with soapy water, uh, dry them off, put them in like a Ziploc bag and either some people like to store them in the refrigerator, other in a cabinet. They need to be somewhere where they're, they're not getting dusty and dirty. Uh, but if you clean the outside of them, rinse them with sterile water, uh, but don't take the insides apart and, and then they should be ready for use the next time. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking almost an hour out of your day to visit with me and share this great information with my visitor or my audience, not visitors, I guess, listeners, that's the word. <laughs> <laughs>
Do not use in pregnant cattle. Abortions can result unless they were vaccinated according to label directions. With any Bovashield Gold FP or PregGuard Gold FP vaccine, pre-breeding initially and within 12 months thereafter. Do not use in calves nursing pregnant cows unless their dams were vaccinated within the past 12 months as described above. To help ensure safety in pregnant cattle, heifers must receive at least two doses of any Bovashield Gold FP or PregGuard Gold FP vaccine with the second dose administered approximately 30 days pre-breeding. And... That's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.